Let's open our Bibles this evening to Exodus 25. We're continuing and looking at the end of the world, what's next, all which is predicated on the nation of Israel. Uh, Next time, we're going to finish this off by going to Romans 9, 10, and 11 to see the most profound theologian of all times, the Apostle Paul, explaining to us that God has a present at that time and a future what we're seeing right now, plan for the nation of Israel. God has sovereignly elected Israel. Not because they're good, not because they are obedient, not because of any reason other than he chose to put his, his love upon them. And he said, I will never, and he uses the same words he uses for us, that he will never leave us or forsake us and no one can pluck us out of his hand and that we are saved to the uttermost. He says the same thing about the descendants of Jacob called Israel. So we're going to see that there is a millennium coming. Uh, It is, as we see tonight, an extension of this temple. In fact, uh, it's, it's eight chapters of the Bible talking about how God makes the whole world not go to Mecca. They go to Jerusalem. and They don't worship Allah. They come and bow before him. And that's a yet future time. But Genesis or um, Exodus 25, we'll read verses 1 and 2 in just a moment. But tonight we need to ponder how the tabernacle, which God intricately designed and described, as well as the four temples that God's word describes. The first one Solomon made, the second one Zerubbabel made, and it was finished off by Herod, walked through by Jesus and the apostles. The third one Jesus describes, and Paul, and Daniel, and John, And the fourth one, the final one, the millennial one, Ezekiel describes. So how the four temples God's word describes fit into God's great plan of the ages. And to understand that, we need to remember that that God's heartbeat is worship. Now think about that. Christians are described by Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 3 as those who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. When Jesus presented the gospel, he said to the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. And all true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. In the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, when when John was overcome seeing the wonders, he got down on his knees in front of an angel, and the angel said, don't do that. Don't worship me. Worship God. The spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus. And so we see that the essence, the heartbeat of the scriptures is worship. And the only thing that God seeks is worship. Do you remember what it says in John 4? It says, God is a spirit and he seeks those to worship him. He seeks. Remember, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, but God, the Father, seeks worshipers. And that's what Christ goes to redeem the lost, bringing them to salvation to become worshipers of God. And the purpose of salvation is worshiping the God of heaven, and that's what we'll be involved with forever. So to start with, this look is far more than a prophetic look to argue over what view you have, whether you have a literal or an amillennial or a millennial or a premillennial. It's more to see the bigger picture, and that's that we, we are to have the heart of a worshiper tonight. But always remind yourself that the tabernacle, which God instructed Moses to construct, covers more chapters. By the way, you're in Exodus 25, it goes all the way to 40, okay? There are 15 solid chapters. God only devotes one chapter to the creation of the universe, and that's from his perspective, and then he gives a second chapter with the same story from our perspective, the cosmological and the anthropological view of the same event. So the whole universe gets one chapter, the tabernacle gets 15. Nothing else takes up so much scripture. No other single project, building, or event takes up as many chapters as this tabernacle. And that means that the tabernacle and later the temple, which is just an enlargement and a solidification of the, of the tent of the tabernacle, but later the temple... They are powerful, the tabernacle and temple together, powerful lessons to guide us in our pursuit 
of deepening our fellowship with the Lord. Well, Exodus 25, look at verses 1 and 2. I love uh, how we get this on the tabernacle. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses. So the Lord is dictating Exodus 25, saying, Moses, write these words down. And, and so Moses begins writing. Verse 2, speak to the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart you shall take my offering. Wow. Now, before we get into the tabernacle, that's important. God loves what? A cheerful giver. And God says, I don't want my tabernacle made from objects that, that you have to pry out of the hands of those Jews. I mean, if they are kind of going, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to give up my gold. He says, don't give it up. Keep it. You can keep it. I, see what he says? Those who give willingly, those with a heart that's willing, you shall take my offering from them. Verse 3, and this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and sweet incense, and onyx stones, and stones to be set in ephod on the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary, verse 8, that I may dwell among them. You know what the tabernacle was all about? The creator who used to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve and have sweet fellowship with them. After they sinned, he was not walking around in their presence anymore. Now he came selectively. He, he met with Enoch and walked with Enoch and talked with him. He met with, with Noah. He met with Abraham. He met with Isaac at times. He met a few times with Jacob. But God wasn't, wasn't hanging around. But he wanted to be with his creatures. And so right here, look what verse 8 says. This is the purpose of the tabernacle and then the four additions of the temple. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, of course, we know that now he dwells within us. But that tabernacle and the temple was for those who did not know him and did not have them dwelling him dwelling in them, for them to see him, to see him illustrated. It was his witness to the world. And so that's the purpose. And look at verse 9. This is how specific it is. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. God didn't just talk in Abraham's sketch. God showed him a heavenly sanctuary. He showed him actual objects that Moses got the dimensions of, got the, the plans for, and, and had constructed in that tent. So never forget, like no other building, God exactly dictated his plans for the structure because the tabernacle shows how to enter into the presence of God. And, and what's amazing, you're going to see in just a moment as we go to other verses, is that the word for tabernacle, the tent, is the same word Jesus used in John chapter 1 when it says the word became flesh and the word is dwelt in English. You know what the word actually comes from? It's from mishkam. It's from dwelling in a tent. Jesus was, was tenting during his earthly incarnation. And truly, we can say that before Christ's incarnation, a pre-incarnation of Christ was the tent, which every we're going to see when I show you the slides. Every element of the tabernacle is not only a, a pathway, a plan of salvation, kind of like a road to God, but every piece of the tabernacle reflects Jesus Christ. In a wonderful way. There's a correspondence with all of his IMs and everything else. So what we need to think about as you sit right here in, in Exodus 25 is of what possible importance could there be to this black tent out in the desert. In fact, today in Israel, the Jews have reconstructed the tabernacle. It's out in the Sinai area, off near Elat, where a lot of people go scuba diving. And so they put it out there so people can come. And it's near Petra, that's in Jordan, another big hot tourist spot. And so they like the tour buses to come there. And when you drive up and see that thing, it's kind of like, huh? I mean, it looks ugly. It's nothing. It's little. It's hardly anything. And you think all oh, the Bible is it, all those chapters are devoted to that? 
Well, of what possible importance could an old, dusty, animal skin tent in the middle of a nomadic, wandering, migratory people camping in the Sinai's trackless desert have to us who live in the 21st century? Well, if we look at this tent constructed centuries ago, we can see how to have light on the dark and sin-stained path we often tread. And every element of the tabernacle still speaks of how we can approach God through Christ. It's, it's actually an illustration of all that Jesus did. And sometimes we've heard it all, but sometimes we don't grasp what Jesus did. But for a moment, think of the tabernacle. If you were to drive to the top of a hill in the wilderness of Sinai's Peninsula 3,400 years ago, you would first see the largest encampment of people ever on the planet. Did you know the children of Israel's wandering was the largest camp out there's ever been? There were over 3 million people camping. I just let that number. You know, we have a lot of trouble with numbers. You know, thousands we're starting to understand, you know, because sometimes you have, you know, bills that high from, you know, medical things or cars. Millions, we can't quite understand, but it's huge. Billions is kind of off the trillions now. But, but think of three million individual people. Now, how do we get that number? Well, it says in the Bible, 603,000 family units, and it says men who were head of families, 603,000 families came out of Egypt. That's what Exodus tells us. There were 603,000 individual family units. A family unit was a man and his wife and their children. Now, normal observant Jews these days have a lot of children. You ever seen what's going on over there in the Orthodox movement? I mean, they have huge families. I mean, they have 8, 10, 12 kids. Now, the secular Jews that have got their eye on their little condo and their bank account have one or two. But these people were, were having, as it says in Exodus, they were fruitful and multiplying. Let's say they all just had a family of five. That's three children, mom and dad. If they were all little families of three children, mom and dad, that is three million people left Egypt. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that it would take a minimum just for their tents, If they just had a tent that would just go down to the sports store and buy a tent for five people and leave enough room to have a little campfire next to it and enough room, you know, to put something over here, maybe your little cart, so you had a little space this big. Do you know how much room it would take to have a campground with little trails and 603,000 campsites? It would take 81 square Miles. You know how big 81 square miles is? It would be all the way, I'm not sure which way west is, but whichever way it is, it would be all the way to Van Cal that way. It would be all the way, if that's east, to Sprinkle. It'd be all the way to D Avenue on the way to Plainwell, and it would be all the way down to Center Street in Portage. That's how big their camp was. That's a 9 by 9, 81 square mile campground. So if you came over the top of that hill, you would see an 81 square mile campground and we would be in the middle of it right now. In fact, this church in that campground would be where the tabernacle was because it was right in the center. So that'll tell you a little bit. If you ever think about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, can you imagine us here holding up a snake on a pole? Can you imagine someone seeing it on Center Street? Think they could see it at Sprinkle, Van Cal, I mean up at D Avenue? That's why the picture of Moses lifting up the serpent in John 3 is a picture of faith. The people that were dying of snake bites over on Sprinkle Road couldn't get to the snake. It was here in the middle of the camp, and they couldn't see it either. They had to believe it was there. And all they had to do is believe that if they obeyed what they were told and looked toward that pole, You know, that's the same true for us today. You know how we're saved? Not because we go to Jerusalem and see where Christ was crucified. It's by faith we look in that direction and believe that he died there in our place. But it was a very large camp, and there's a lot of lessons from it. Um, Just to think about three million people, if the three million Israelites walked out of Egypt in a line five people wide, that means one family. If they they went out five wide, 603,000 families walking behind each other, And I'm not counting all their animals and 
cart with their tent on it. If it's just the people walking five abreast like this with a normal arm's width between them, did you know that the three million people would have been 225 miles long? You know how far that is? That's from here to Gaylord, almost to the Mackinac Bridge, of solid five wide people walking. Probably they walked wider than that. If they walked 50 wide, it was only 22 miles long. That's just about two-thirds of the way to Battle Creek. It's a lot of people. Sometimes, you know, we just read all this and it just goes by. In fact, feeding them was one of the most amazing things. One of the great miracles of the Exodus and wilderness wanderings was keeping those children of Israel alive to feed three million people a small meal. You know, not three Big Macs and, you know, whatever, but a small meal three times a day would take a train of 1,300 boxcars nine and a half miles long every day. Now, that's a lot. And God fed them and watered them for 40 years out in the desert. But they had a big camp, 81 square miles. They had a little tent we're going to see. It's called the tabernacle. But do you know what that big camp and little tent mean? God was approachable. Do you know what the lesson is? It's not to examine the hairs of the tent. It's why did he throw it in the middle of the camp? It's because he wanted to be approachable. That's why Jesus came and dwelt among us. Did you know we're heading on to Christmas? Do you know what the message of Christmas is? And the word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is? Yeah, God with us. God wants to be with us. And did you know that's because he loves and seeks and wants us to approach him. And he's left us. Uh, I was talking to someone um, this morning after the service, and they said, nobody understands me, I'm really lonely. And they said, and I call people and they won't answer their phones. I said, I know someone that always answers when you call. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I said, he said they said, I want to hear a voice. I said, I hear God talk when I read this. You see, God is approachable. He's given us his voice. We can approach him and hear him and then reflect back and speak. But tonight, we're looking at something right in the middle of that 81 square mile camp, and it's called the tabernacle. It's the center of the camp. It has smoke slowly rising from an altar, and with the 12 tribes in an orderly arrangement around it, looking intently, we've seen a long, black, unattractive tent made of porpoise skins. Hmm. Do you know what they use those those badger hides or porpoise skins, depending on which translation you have. Do you know what they use those things for? It's what they made their shoes out of. That was their source of leather for their sandals. Did you know when God said in chapter 25 that you just read, if they want to bring me this stuff, do you think they are leaving on a camp out? When you go camping, I mean, I just sat in a blind all day and I was counting my apples and my little, you know, how many ounces I had in my little water bottle. Can you imagine going on a 40-year camp out? I mean, you'd be saying, honey, don't give them too much of that leather. You know, we've got to make shoes for the kids. We got, for us, too. And what if we get a hole in our tent? You see why the Lord says, only give me from a willing heart. Now, for those people that gave up their badger skins, do you know what they learned happened, or their porpoise skins? Their shoes never wore out for 40 years. See, the Lord supernaturally compensated for what they did, and that's an amazing thing in itself. But God's grace is that the people that didn't give their badger skins, he still didn't make their shoes wear out either, so that shows he's such a wonderful God. But when, when you got inside the, the tabernacle tent itself, you'd find yourself surrounded by shining gold. If you looked up on the curtained roof, you'd see the wings of cherubim woven into the fabric of the ceiling. There was blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen. And the only light that was seen inside the tabernacle itself was light from candlesticks or the glow of the Shekinah glory of God. You know, that reminds us of Jesus Christ himself. To a natural, unsaved person looking at Christ, they see no beauty that they should desire him. Isn't that what Isaiah said? When we looked upon him, we saw nothing beautiful that we should desire him. He had no form or comeliness, as it says in Isaiah 53. His face was so marred more than any man. But when we who know him and love him see that, We are drawn to such love because to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. It's the same way. To the unbeliever, they would have looked at the tabernacle and said, that thing's ugly, it's black, it's smoky, it's got animal hair on it, I'm not interested. But to those who got to look inside, 
They saw the wonder of God who was knowable. The tabernacle teaches us so much about the wonders of our God. The tabernacle was a journey into the presence of God. And the tabernacle shows us how to come into the presence of God. Each of the elements that are described, and if you look at chapter 25, starting in verse 10 is the Ark of the Testimony. In chapter 25, verse 10. In verse 23, the table of showbread. Verse 31, the golden lampstand. Then the outside of the tabernacle is chapter 26. You can just go through the altar of burnt offerings in chapter 27. It talks about the, the courtyard. You can just flip through this and see. Each element is described. But the primary lesson to learn about the tabernacle is where God placed it. God placed it right in the middle. He wanted every time. And by the way, they were all supposed to pitch their tents with the tent flap facing the tabernacle. And it was almost like when you got up in the morning, there was only one door way out of your tent. And when you walked out of your tent and ducked down and got up, the first thing you saw in the distance was the smoke rising and the Shekinah glory cloud like a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud that was over the center of the camp. You see, the Lord said, I want you to orient your life on me. As soon as you get up in the morning, when you go out to to do what you have to do early in the morning to get that cup of coffee to go wash your face, I want the first thing to see when you get up out of your tent to be me, my presence. I want to be right in the center of your life. Is the first thing you see the glory of the Lord? Is that the first thing you saw this morning? How about yesterday? How about the day before? Or was it the glow of your electronic device as you feverishly... You know, some people sleep with these things. Every time it makes a noise, they check it. They don't want to miss a tweet. They don't want to miss an email. They don't want to miss anything. And, and the same people say, you know, I don't get anything out of the Bible. You know, the Lord says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek for me with what? Yeah, all. When, when you duck out of your tent, the first thing you look at is me. He said, you're seeking me first. And that is a lesson from the tabernacle. Well, if you, and, and I'll show you this in the slides, if you were to draw a straight line from the center of the tabernacle to the gate of the entry gate, you would find, if you, if you looked at the tabernacle, you know, had this big row of curtains all the way around, and there was only one door in, by the way. I'll show you that on the slide. It was a huge door, though. It was 30 feet wide. The door in the tabernacle was huge, but there was only one. Just like there was only one ark. There aren't many ways to God. There aren't many religions. There's one revelation. There are many religions, but they don't take you to God. There's one revelation of God. And it has a very wide door, but there's only one. And no one can get in any other way. So God said, there's only one way to me, and it's my way, but it's a big way, so there's room for everybody. But as soon as you walked in, the first thing you ran into is that brazen altar, because sin has to be dealt with. You can't come to God as, as one who is still bearing their sin. And you had to leave your sin. Do you remember what would happen? You'd put your hands on the, uh, well, actually the father representing the family behind him would put his hands on the head of the animal, confessing his and their sins over it, saying, we are sinners and we can't do anything with our sin. We need a substitute. And all of those rams and lambs and, and every sacrificial animal, every one of them were standing in for Christ. Until the, that's why John the Baptist, when he saw him, pointed at him, he says, behold, not a Lamb of God. He said, what? The. That's, that's the one we've been waiting for. It's the only one we need. All these were just fill-ins, and all the ones are just look-backs. But he's the one. And so that brazen altar was first. And right after that, after you got the sin dealt with, then you go to the laver, because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us. And you had to keep confessing and cleansing. But then you could go into the holy place. And the holy place with the, with the uh, candlesticks on the left to light the entrance and the showbread on the right to feed. And then the altar of incense at the back, which only could through that doorway where that incense was could you get into the holy of holies. It's such a picture of how to come into intimacy with the Almighty. Well, 
The Old Testament worship centered first on the tabernacle from about 14... 46 BC, and that date is in the Bible, so we do know when the Exodus was, and no matter what any textbook says, the Bible exactly tells us when the children of Israel left the land of Israel, or left the land of Egypt, and it was 480 years before Solomon built the temple. And, and you can look up in any history book when Solomon built that temple. The, the, it's in the news all the time. They call it 3000 BC. I mean, 3,000 years ago, 1,000 B.C., it was actually 971. And 971 plus 480 tells us exactly when the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. But from that time, 1500 B.C. onward, the, the worship of God focused on this revelation of his tabernacle. After 500 years of the tabernacle, they constructed the temple in the time of Solomon. And it was divinely designed, not only the structure, but the liturgy. And for 1500 nearly unbroken years, God was worshipped until the time that the temple, the second temple, was destroyed by Titus and the Roman legions. And then God allowed there to be a a synagogue going out throughout all the earth of all these synagogues that that kept up the Jewish worship, even though there was no temple. The, The tabernacle was was near Jerusalem and it was kept there in Shiloh. Then it was made into a temple by Solomon that was in Jerusalem and Nebuchadnezzar came in 586 BC and leveled it and stole the gold. And then Zerubbabel came back 70 years later and built another one in 530 BC. And that one continued with modifications till the time of Christ. But after the time of Christ, the Romans ended God's temples on this earth. And of course, we became the living, walking temples. But what's amazing is that there is a future time coming. Matthew 24 describes, Second Thessalonians 2 describes, Revelation 11 describes, and Daniel chapter 9 describes when there's going to be a temple for Jews sacrificing and worshiping God again in Jerusalem. And that's what is causing the Muslim world to go into a lather because they don't want that. All of Islam is focused on one thing, to keep the Jews from worshiping God on Mount Moriah and to keep the Christians from worshiping God on that place where the Spirit fell, where the church was born, where Christ was crucified. They don't want us or them worshiping the true God. Allah is all about suffocating the knowledge of the true and living God. So the Lord has plans, and I want you to see it. Look at John chapter 1 with me in verse 14, just before we go tonight. Because John 1, 14 reminds us that for this present time, we don't need a temple. We are his temple. And it says that the answer to both the tabernacle and the temple are the incredible picture of salvation that's through Christ alone. Up until the time of Christ, it was the tabernacle and temple that kept saying, this one that's coming, he's going to be the, the sin bearer like the brazen altar. He's going to be the sin cleanser like the laver. He's going to be the golden lampstand, the light of the world. He's going to be the bread of life. He's going to be the great high priest that ever lives to make incense rise. Every piece of the tabernacle and temple was one of Christ's characteristics of his eternal attributes. Every piece. But after that, the actual one that was being portrayed showed up. And that's John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He tented among us. He was incarnated among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as, the o- as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then zip down to verse 18. No one has seen God at any time, period. Now look at the next phrase. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. The word declared is exegeo or exegeo, as in exegesis of the Scripture or exegetical preaching. It's the unfolding of the Word and the revealing of the truth within. And it says that Jesus, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He's explained God. 
And the writer of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 goes beyond that. And he says that Jesus is the exact representation of God. That's why the next time you hear some liberal preacher saying, well, the God of the Old Testament is this warring God. And the God of the New Testament is this meek, mild, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't injure a fly kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Same person, though. How can they say that? Because they don't know him. They don't realize that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. And the angel of the Lord was Jesus Christ. And the one that went through ahead of them and took the, the, the powerful conquest and led them in was the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the God of the Old Testament. He's the exact representation of God. In fact, W.A. Criswell, the great Southern Baptist theologian, used to always put it this way. He said, when you get to heaven, you're not going to see three gods running around. Go, there's God one. Oh, God two. God three. Hi. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is what? Three? One. There's one God eternally existing in three persons. The amazing thing, if you read closely, two of them are invisible. They have no form. The Holy Spirit takes the form of a dove at times, takes the form of fire at times. But he is a spirit. And a spirit you can't see. It's non-corporeal, has no body, it's invisible, a spirit is. And the Father is the same. The only God you'll see is Jesus, because he's the exact... Now, there's still going to be, and and we don't lose the Trinity, because the Father and my Son is on my right hand, and the Spirit, there's always three persons. But there aren't three gods walking around. There's one. The only one you see is Jesus Christ. And that's why the tabernacle was revealing him. And he reveals, look at verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son in the bosom of the father has declared him. Now, St. Augustine, you say you have to really be careful with the Trinity. He said it's such a profound doctrine that if you just believe it, you can be like a little baby sitting in the beach. And, and the water's this deep, and you can splash in it and enjoy it. But if you try and plumb the depths, it's like an elephant going out in the ocean. It drowns. So, so you just believe the revelation. It's hard to understand how one God can be in three persons. And there's a lot of crazy explanations, kind of like the chicken or the egg, the yolk, and the shell. That's, that's not a good one. How about water? Water, steam, ice. You ever heard that one? That's not good either because water is not steam and it's not ice. They're three different forms of the same substance, so that's called modalism. So you don't be very careful with any of the cute. The Trinity is incomprehensible except by faith. You just believe because God said it. And Jesus is the revelation of the Father. But what exactly does the tabernacle show us? Well, it shows us, and I, I will give you these and I'll show them real quickly on a slide. Number one, the tabernacle in the center of the camp tells us that God wants us to live in his presence. And God wants you to live in his presence, and I hope if you don't remember anything else from tonight, that you realize that when you get out of your tent tomorrow morning, the first thing you ought to look at is at God right in the center of your life. And a great way to do that is, you know what I do? I mean, I, get, I think I get 120, 150 emails every day and I know they're sitting there, and I'm just itching, you know, to look at them. And, of course, I have all these news gators, and I'm just following prophetic news. But you know what? I won't fire it up, you know, get online, until I have time listening to the voice of the Lord. And I long to have him be the first one I seek in my day. And, you know, you can do that, too. You can do that in many ways. If you have a long commute, you can listen to him in your car instead of the radio, instead of the tunes. You can listen to the Bible. Or you can have a, a, a verse that's taped to the mirror as you're shaving in the morning, men. Or you can have one in the, in the, as you're getting ready, ladies, taped to the mirror. And just have his word be the first thing that starts your day. And the Lord says, seek me first. The tent in the center of the camp means God wants us living in his presence, seeking him first. The brazen altar was the first object when you entered the tabernacle, and that means God wants us to come to him. That's the doctrine of satisfaction, that that God wants us to come to him, and he's made a way for our sins to be dealt with. The laver means God wants to cleanse away anything that keeps us from being close to him. The golden lampstand that made the holy place visible is God wants us walking in his light. The showbread, God wants to nourish our souls. You know, the, the world is trying to fill 
the emptiness in her life with everything, with money, with excitement, with experience, with pleasure, with, with stuff. God says, I want to fill you. He says, you'll seek me and find me, and you'll find that I am the joy and rejoicing of your heart, that you know me. The altar of incense at the doorway to the Holy of Holies is God wants us to realize, remember my friend Imed? That was one of the best sermons I've heard in an awful long time about you and I pray and the Holy Spirit prays with us and the Holy Spirit prays over us and he filters out all the stuff we shouldn't be praying for and all the dumb stuff and takes out and changes it into the perfect will of God and presents it to God. And that's what that altar of incense is all about. What a wonderful reminder that Christ ever lives to intercede for us and the Holy Spirit prays with us. And then the veil separating the holiest of all from everything else reminds us that God tore that away at the cross. Do you remember? And we're going to study that at Easter, Lord willing, if we're all still alive and America's still standing, you know, after Iran does all their stuff. We're, if we make it to Easter, we're going to look at the five mighty miracles of Calvary. One of them was the veil split. And that means God wants us, as Hebrews 4 says, to boldly come to the throne of grace and mercy. He wants us to come to to ask him on the basis of his covenant to hear and to answer our prayers. The mercy seat in the Holy of Holies covered with blood reminds us that we should rest in Christ's sacrifice alone. And you know what? Uh, this morning it was wonderful. An elder prayer meeting, one of the elders was praying and it was precious prayer. You know what he said? He says, my heart is grieved that the longer I listen to people share their testimonies, I don't hear them saying the simple truth that Jesus gave himself for me, and that's how I know I'm going to heaven, and I'm trusting in his work. So don't grieve that elder anymore. When you give your testimony, it's he gave himself for me. Let's practice. Say that with me. He gave himself for me. Now, you just shared your testimony if you really believe that. And that should come out. And if someone asks you how you know you're going to heaven, don't tell them it's because you go to Calvary. No one's going to heaven because they go here. In fact, we have people going here that aren't going to heaven, so don't tell them that. Tell them you're going to heaven because someone, a perfect someone named Jesus Christ, gave himself for me. He died in my place. The substitutionary atonement is the essence of salvation. It's not that I prayed, that I joined, that I walked, that I got baptized, that I whatevered, or that I've done all this good stuff and it, it outdoes my bad stuff. No amount of good stuff you and I could ever do can, outdo, can weigh out any bad stuff because it's like filthy rags, all the good stuff we do. It's Christ alone who gave himself for me. And that's what that mercy seat. In fact, Paul takes the Hebrew word for the mercy seat and and he takes that into the book of Romans and that's what propitiation is. The doctrine that that God's wrath was was appeased and satisfied by the sacrifice of the blood of Christ poured out. What a wonder. And finally, the last object there, the Ark of the Covenant is that we should be trusting in his promises. So every detail of the tabernacle, every piece of furniture, the color, the placement, everything is engineered to point to Christ. And Jesus came to reveal God the Father. The past tabernacle, the temple, and the future temples of God are all designed to point us to Christ. Uh, You know that the children of Israel were in the land of Goshen up here somewhere. uh, From right in this area to, to walk right down there to Suez, where the Suez Canal is, that is about 100 miles uh, from Goshen to here. And then down to Mount Sinai is about 175. So we're talking about quite a distance. Uh, but the tabernacle, the plans were received right down here. So the children of Israel were uh, up here in the land of Goshen. They, it's possible. See, we're not sure. They could have been in this area, and then this is the part of the Red Sea they crossed. We don't know. There's another view right here is where, if you've ever seen that, special video that guy's selling, Cornuki or whatever, Cornucky, whatever his name is. He believes that uh, Bob, a uh, wonderful Christian man, uh, he believes this is where they crossed, that they actually went, and he considers this to be Mount Sinai. But it doesn't matter. Probably it could be over there because there's the land of Midian where um, Moses' father-in-law was. But however, whether they crossed this one or this one, it doesn't matter. But God drowned the uh, Pharaoh's army. And whether this is Mount Sinai or this is Mount Sinai, the plans were given to Moses. Okay, next slide. Um, There's how they went, probably. Okay, next. 
Uh, the tabernacle. Next one. I'll just go through these. In addition to the two, remember, God wrote the ten words on the two tablets of stone. Well, in addition to that, Moses also received a set of engineering specs for a portable sanctuary. Next slide. The scriptures devote more space to the tabernacle than any other object. Next slide. The, uh, the book of Leviticus tells us about the structure. Next the furniture, I showed you that, the priesthood, and then the offerings, that's in Leviticus. So starting in Exodus 25, we have all the way down through uh, 40, this stuff, and then the whole book of Leviticus emphasizes the offerings. So there's 27 chapters more about how to sacrifice. Next slide. Um, Here's what the tabernacle looked like. It was oriented with the gateway to the east. And that's the same way as the temple in Jerusalem. And that has a lot to do with, uh, I don't know if you realize, but proper Christian burial is that, that your head is such that when you sit up, you're facing the east. Now, people, I mean, I've been burying people for 30 years, and it's, it's changing by the minute. You know, I, the younger the, the uh, funeral directors are, the less they understand custom. But before Christ, there were no cemeteries. There were necropoli. You've heard of a necropolis, a city of the dead. They're in all the ancient world. But when Christianity came, people were buried in koimeos. That's a sleeping place. And koimeo in Greek became, in English, cemetery. And a cemetery was where you laid in the ground waiting to sit up and look toward the east where your Redeemer was coming from because he was coming to the Mount of Olives, which was on the east side of Jerusalem. So God oriented the doorway to look east. And so you were supposed to have your head in the west so when you sat up you'd look east. But who cares, you know, because we're all going to dust anyway. But that was the original idea. Okay, next. Um, 75 feet this way, next, 150 feet long and 75 wide. See that 30-foot door right there, the only entrance in. Next slide. Uh, the, the 10 cubits, you see how much 10 cubits is to show you, you know, 10, 10, 10, 10. Go ahead. Next slide. Uh, the total perimeter was 300 or the length of Noah's Ark, which is just a little fact. Next. Uh, here's the burnt offering altar. Next. Next one, the laver, and say the word. Next, the holy place, and within it, it had these objects. First one, um, the holy place had the, the golden lampstand, seven uh, lamps like a menorah that you see in Revelation, the table of showbread or the bread of the face. Showbread means bread of face. And the idea was, here's something cute. I say this when we're in communion. God was on this side. They were on this side. The bread was there. When they came to the bread, they were facing God. That's what show bread means. It means looking at the face of God. You're coming to a table, and you're on this side, and I'm on this side. We're all on this side, and God's on this side, and he's looking at us as we come to the table. In fact, communion is when we get invited to eat with God. And we're on one side, he's on the other side of the table. That's the picture we get from the tabernacle. And here's the altar of incense. Uh, oh, there we go. Altar, golden altar. And now this is the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. And at the top is the mercy seat. And look what it says in John 14. The word was made flesh and the word dwelt is actually tabernacled among us. Okay, next slide. The coverings, and oh, this is so interesting. This is what it was made of. The cherubim were made of gold. And by the way, everything in the tabernacle reflects the four Gospels. Just like Matthew talked about Christ's royalty, there, there are the, the sacrificial lamb. The, this, this would be the, um, the book of Mark where he's the willing servant that suffered. Book of John where he is divine. Book of, of Matthew where he is the king wearing purple. And golden is uh, uh, the book of Luke talking about Christ as the perfect one. You know, gold is perfect and it doesn't corrode and all that. So the embroidered linen had cherubim made with these four colored uh, types of weavings. Next, um, the goat's hair. Remember the goat, the, the scapegoat and all that? The goat's hair covering the outside of the tent reminded them constantly of the sin bearer because twice a year on, on the Yom HaKippurim, they had to 
take two goats and one goat they confess her sin over and and it was released to wander in the wilderness and the other one they push off you know and they would kill and they would push the the sin bearer off the edge of the cliff so their sins would be gone so every time they saw a goat's hair they thought of sin bearing that was the outside next the ram skins were dyed red to remind them of blood next the porpoise hides, remember they were supposed to make their shoes out of it, was the over, kind of like the rain slicker over that thing. Next slide. So let's talk about what this means. Next slide. The outer area, and keep going, we'll have to do this. There was an inner court, so there, was, there were three parts. The next one, there was this holy place. Okay, what does that mean? Next slide. Uh, now you you get the idea of why there's such a dispute because the tabernacle seems to imply a three-part preparation uh, to approach God. Body, next. Soul, next. Spirit. So, So it's very interesting. There were certain things that were supposed to be taken care of in the outer area, and it talked about cleansing this. Then it talked about preparing this the, the uh, burnt offering and labor weren't to clean the body. You were supposed to take care of that before you came in that door. But your soul was cleansed, and then your spirit was communing with God. So it's just an interesting analogy. Next slide. The breastplate, I could go through this. These are all the way through. In fact, uh, you find them in the foundations of, uh, and gates of Jerusalem, the, the 12 uh, tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Real quickly, before we go tonight, though, I will just read this to you. We should be much more serious about worshiping the Lord. And our attitude for coming before God often is abrupt. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how we just come walking in here, you know, with everything and, and fiddling with our stuff, and, and we just go right like that into worship. And we should all work to make sure. In fact, I tell my kids every time a party or something is available on Saturday night, I say, no, 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 no. I said, in God's mind, a day is an evening and a morning make a day. God actually considers, and so do you, it's, it's kind of like beginning Monday right now. Sunday night is the evening before Monday starts. And you've got to get ready for school and work. Saturday night is when you most importantly prepare for Sunday morning. And so what I would say is the very last thing to do on a Saturday night would go watch some werewolf, vampire, blood, uh, you know, immoral movie, uh, you know, that's popular right now, and, and go watch that and totally blow your mind and grieve and quench the Holy Spirit, and then come in here on Sunday morning and say, hey, let's worship the Lord. Come on, clap your hands. No. No. God should be approached reverently. I'll read you the sign that's in John Bunyan, you know, Pilgrim's Progress Bunyan. He was a pastor in Bedford, England, and he had this poem framed, and it's still in the entry room before you walk up to the pulpit. And this is what it said. He'd read this every time he walked in to preach. And this is by the door that went into the pulpit. Enter this door as if the floor within were gold, and every wall of jewels all, of wealth untold, as if the choir in robes of fire were singing here, nor shout, nor hush, nor rush, for God is near. And that's how we should approach our holy God. I would encourage you this week, when you get up out of your tent, look toward the center of camp. And in the center of your camp should be the Lord. And the best way to see him is in his book. And it's really a good habit to look for him every day. Not a lot, just a little. It'll grow on you. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for all these tabernacles and temples that you built to show us that the word became flesh and has dwelt among us. And I pray we would seek you and find you every day of this week when we seek you with all of our heart. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.